Hi there, Toy here, and I'm going to be doing my first spoiler review. So if you saw my um, reviews for the month of July, you know that I was really excited about one book in particular and said I wanted to talk about it some more, so that's what this video is. I am going to be doing a spoiler review for Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. So first I just want to kind of talk about um, the book itself and kind of like how I discovered it basically because I follow books and authors, you know, social media, blogs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I subscribe to a couple of newsletters where I find out about deals on books and things like that. And so it was either my Goodreads newsletter or my book uh, newsletter. One of them talked about this book. And so I just, I'm as soon as I saw it, I was like, I gotta have that. <laughs> and so, um... If you aren't familiar with Rick Riordan, um, I'm not going to say you've been living under a rock. I mean, you just might be an adult who um, missed it when you were a kid and never really got into his middle grade series, Percy Jackson or the Olympians or the other things that he's done. But he's really famous for taking the um, Greek pantheon of gods and bringing them into um, kind of a fresh new feel for young adults and um, like teenagers, preteens, tweens, things like that, and creating like demigods and things like that, and just bringing, you know, these stories from ancient times into kind of a modern time. And so he's, he's been doing that for a while. Other people have been doing it for a while. I think most people in Western civilizations are familiar with the Greek gods and many of their tales. Um, and they're great stories, but um, for someone like myself, it, I like the idea of learning about something different. And so I really think it's cool what Rick Ray Orton is doing is because Tristan Strong, Punch of the Sky is just one of many. He has a whole series where it's the Rick Ray Orton Presents series where he's doing um, stories that represent different cultures. And I didn't even realize it, but I've actually downloaded some of these other stories. And so I really want to start getting into them. And so um, these are just basically uh, other representation, you know, um, Asian stories and Middle Eastern stories and just stuff that's different from what's just been like the mainstream for so long and I think that's really cool. Now cut to this book. Um, I'm discover I discovered this book you know during the time of COVID and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement after the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and a bunch of other people and it's just really it's it's not easy, people. We all know that it's not. We we're gonna continue to fight and you know for improvements and changes and acceptance and all that kind of stuff. But during this time, it really kind of affected my reading, and um, I I have always struggled with reading nonfiction. That's not new, especially if you follow this channel. I do try to read something nonfiction at least once a month or every other month. I'm getting better at it. So considering all that's going on right now, everyone's just making all these recommendations about books to read. And most of them are nonfiction, and I'm just not going to do that right now. I'm just not going to lie. I'm just not going to do that. I will eventually read a lot. I, I've purchased some of these books. Some of them I already had and just never read them. Some of them I purchased because of what's happening right now. But I have to wait till I'm in the right mindset to read something like that. This, on the other hand, was this is what someone like me needs. If you're someone who loves to dive into an escapism type story, something filled with magic or powers or just, you know, something outside of the norm to take you away from reality, this story might appeal to you because unlike a lot of those stories which have a place in time, this particular story doesn't take you so much out of reality that you forget what's really going on in the world. And I have a feeling some of the other stories in the series might do the same too. We get so caught up in this mainstream culture that underrepresents so many people that we, when we try to escape from that we fall into a world of like you know werewolves or vampires and those types of things which again nothing wrong with those but this is the type of escapism story where you're still dealing with people that you can relate to and to see this from a black person's point of view it was just oh my goodness so um, i feel like i'm rambling a lot so first thing i want to do is talk about the cover which you'll see on the screen for Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky. So looking at the cover right away, um, it, it kind of it stands out easily. You know the colors are great, but clearly there's two black people on the cover of this book. Two black men on the cover of this book: an older man and a young man, and they are clearly going into battle. Um, if you look around the bottom of the picture, you can see something that kind of looks like metal claws and for me, I knew right away that these were like shackles. At least that's what they, they thought they were. And then, you know, once you read the book, you find out 
again, remember, this is a spoiler review, that there is something called, I think it's called Federlings, if I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sorry, but basically they are, they're not animatronic because these things are like, they're, they're shackles, but they are alive and they're going out and they're capturing people and dragging them away. And if you don't get the symbolism in that, I don't know how to explain it to you. I mean, these are basically things that were used to bound and enslave black people. I'm sure they've been used at other times, but in, for this particular instance, this is, these are the things that the slaves had to, you know, endure. You know, a lot of times they had to wear shackles while they were working in fields and things like that. And so the fact that that's one of the, 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 the enemies in this story, and it's, it's right there present on the cover, you don't, may not notice it right away, but the second you start reading the story and they first appear, you remember what you saw on the cover of the book because that's what happened with me. Like I saw that on the cover of the book and I was like, those look like metal claws. I didn't, I knew there was something about them, but I didn't really know. And then when I first, when they first appeared in the story, I immediately went back to that and I was like, whoa, this, this story is like not holding back punches with the symbolism and the metaphors. I mean, these are literal shackles. So that's one thing, you know, it's on the cover, getting back to it. So we see the young man, you know, at the front, and he's got, like, his fists up. And that's really important to the story. Um, if you, I think the description may talk about it. I, I, I'm not going to go into it right now. But, you know, he has a lineage of boxing. And then you see the man standing behind him holding the hammer. And most black people are going to immediately think, oh, it's John Henry. And you're absolutely right. It's John Henry. And for anyone who doesn't know who John Henry is, you need to get caught up on your tall tales. I feel like in this day and age, if you know who Paul Bunyan is, you should know who Don Henry is, plain and simple. And if you don't, you need to fix that. So if you don't know who bon um, <laughs> Paul Bunyan is, then that's fine that you don't know who Don Henry is. So that's him on the cover with Tristan, and clearly they're going into battle. And so the part of the book that, that was hard for me to see that I didn't really pick up on until, again, when I read it in the book, is what's going on in the sky. Because I feel like the title kind of covers it up a little bit, but you've got like this purpley, pinkish, bluish thing kind of going on in the sky, and you almost miss the little rip that's in the sky, which that's clearly the whole that Tristan punched. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. So that's the cover of the book. As soon as I saw it, I knew I wanted to read the book. And yeah, and, and I love that so many elements um, from that cover present themselves in the book. So let's let's get into kind of the basic plot of the book. So at the beginning of the story, we meet Tristan Strong, and he is not in a good place in his life. He literally just watched his best friend die and he's been training as a boxer because he comes from a lineage of boxers and he is not prepared for this match and he loses the match. So he's being shipped off for the summer weekend, I don't remember, I think it's the summer, to go to his grandparents' farm. So this is the first criticism that I have of the book and it might be probably the only one, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. But <laughs> there's a lot of stories, whether it's about black people, white people, Asian people, it doesn't matter. It always seems like whenever there's some young person going through like a struggle, they get sent away to the country as though everybody in their family has relatives in the country. Come on now. Not only is he getting sent off to the country, to their farm. So, I mean, part of me likes this concept, likes the idea that we have this, you know, black family who owns their own, own farm. Like, I love that idea. But I also think it's kind of cliche that stories like this happen where the kid, doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, gets sent off to the country while other things are happening. So, there, yeah, that wasn't like, like a major issue for me. It was more of just like, okay, I get it. So anyway, so he gets sent off to the country, um, for the, I think for the summer, um, with his grandmother and grandfather. And you immediately begin to realize that the, grand, bleh, <laughs> that the grandmother knows more than she lets on um, because of just kind of the conversations, which I think most people can agree that grandmas are like the glue. They're the ones who are the mediators. They take care of the husband. They take care of the kids. They take care of the grandkids, but all in a different way. Like grandmas somehow know how to reach people in their, you know, in their family in different ways. And I think, you know, this grandmother kind of represents that. And so what we, see, what we find out while Tristan is on this journey to, um, you know, spend the summer with his grandparents is that he's been given a book left to him by his recently deceased friend. And at first, you just think, okay, it's this notebook that he's, you know, putting off reading. Because let's be honest, when somebody passes and you're left something of theirs, you don't always want to jump right into it. You, you need time. And so that's what you think is happening at this point, is that he just needs time. He's not ready to get into this book. And so all of a sudden, the book starts to act a little strange, to do some things. And Tristan notices it. <laughs> and even the grandmother at one point kind of notices that there's something on the book that didn't appear to be there before. I'm trying not to give too much away, but this is a spoiler review. So you find out quickly that not only is this book special because it belonged 
to Tristan's friend Eddie who just passed is that they had been working on collecting stories together they had worked on this book together so it, it doesn't just belong to Eddie it also kind of belongs to him too and the stories that they were collecting is what gets him into trouble and sends him on his journey his adventure so I'm gonna try to speed this up a little bit but I really wanted to spend some time explaining that so the overall concept of this story, if you've read some of the other works that um, Rick Riordan presents, and even his own work, is that there's going to be like gods and demigods appearing at some point. And the book of stories is what kind of sets that all into motion. So at some point, Tristan has like a vision where he sees what appears to be John Henry. He doesn't know it's John Henry at the time, but he kind of is like, this dude looks familiar. And he also sees him with this kind of um, furry bunny character, which some of you might be thinking, ding, ding, ding. Is that, is that Burr Rabbit? Yeah, it's Br'er Rabbit. And so, and if you don't know the story of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and all that, you can look it up. Um, so he sees this vision. He's not sure who these characters are, but that's who they are. And they're sending something through, like, a, a portal or something on a mission. But he doesn't know what's being sent, and he doesn't know what the mission is. Well, he soon finds out that someone has been sent to collect his book of stories, the book of stories that he and Eddie had worked on. And the person that they send is none other than Gum Baby. Gum Baby is a character that I've heard about before, but I never knew her story. I, I, I mean, I, you know, like sometimes you hear about something, but you don't hear the story. So I actually had to do a little bit of research to find out more about Gum Baby. And Gum Baby is hilarious in this story. There's, a little, there's comic relief here and there throughout this story, but most of it comes from Gum Baby. And so basically Gum Baby is a little wooden doll who um, has like been brought to life because of a spell and she's got a lot of attitude and you don't know this right away but she's trying to prove herself so she sneaks into his room and tries to steal his notebook in the middle of the night hi Margie how you doing <laughs> and so of course he sees this and he's thinking he's having a nightmare or that he's hallucinating or something and so he's like fighting with gum baby trying to get this notebook and she's throwing sap at him and stuff and there's more to it but again I don't want to give too many spoilers away so anyway they end up in the bottle tree forest and if you don't know what a bottle tree is look that up as well I've heard of them before I've never actually seen one like in real life but I've read stories um, where they've been featured and heard people talk about them um, if you grew up in the South, it was kind of a split down the middle. Um, most people know a lot of the South, not all of it, but a lot of it is part of what's called the Bible Belt. And so a lot of um, traditions from other cultures, especially the African cultures, were lost because of how deeply um, imprinted the mainstream or the white man's culture was embedded. And so, you know, most people were converted to Christianity generations later. They didn't really talk about a lot of the, the things and the folklore of the past. So you had people who would share the stories just to keep them, you know, in the people's minds, but didn't really, like, believe in any of these things. And so then you have the other people who just stopped talking about them altogether. And I think I grew up around, the, you know, in the area where people just stopped talking about them altogether. I learned about bottle trees later through my own, like, reading and education and stuff like that. So um, for some people, it was part of their culture and some it wasn't. Sorry again if I'm rambling. So anyway, he um, is fighting with Gum Baby in the bottle tree force, and he breaks one of the bottles which is a problem because at the same time that he breaks the bottle, he hits the ground with his fist and you find out that he's falling into this hole that he made and he's come out on the other end and the hole that he made in the ground is now a hole in the sky in a new world. And so he's in this new world. And you know what? Let me pull out my candle real quick and I might be able to show this to you. I might not. We'll see. Um, so anyway, he's in this new world, and I believe it's called Alk. So in Alk, he realizes that something horrible is happening. A world that, when you look at it, should be beautiful, looks like it's been devastated. And when he first arrives, he ends up on what is, what is essentially a ship made of bones. So again, there's, there's a lot here that, that is, you know, symbolism, imagery, all kinds of things that lead, that lead you back to the origins of you know black people in America and so for me that bone ship just just the idea of it in general kind of makes you think of like death but more than that is the passage you know of the slaves coming from Africa to America you know they may not have been literal bone ships but they were ships of bones because so many slaves died making their way over and so to have that kind of depicted as a ship literally made of bones that, that's another level. But I was able to pull up my picture, which you may not be able to see it, but I'm just going to do my best. I'm going to put down the um, brightness a little bit and see if you can just kind of get a glimpse. Oh, 
I must have, okay, here we go. Yeah, I don't really know if that worked, but anyway. So it's the world of Alk, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, but there's an E at the end, so it could be Alki, I don't know. Um, so there's two, as you saw, there were two islands that were part of this world, and um, water in between. And again, I'm not trying to give you too many details. I want there, there to be something for you to read. So he lands in part of this world that is set apart from the mainland, and it's called Midpass. And there is where he discovers the what in this world would be like their lesser gods. And um, they're, I don't know that they're actually called lesser gods. Sorry, I'm doing like a bunch of stuff. <laughs> but so in mid, in the Midpass part of Alk, the gods there are folktales, folktale characters who basically come to life and now serve as um, now serve as like you know uh, deities or demigods in this world and they are protectors of the world that they live in but not I mean come on you know how these stories work if they're protecting that world they're also protecting our world and so that's where he you know meets these legendary characters like um, John Henry and the Brer Fox and the Brer Rabbit so again I'm dragging so let me get into this a little bit more so he, he meets a band of characters they tell him what's going on um, creatures have been coming out in the dark and stealing people away they never see these people again they're all presumed to be dead and then there's this one particular thing that no one wants to speak about and I'm not gonna say what it is I actually leave that to you and so but they all feel like this is what it is that's taking the people this this one thing that no one wants to speak about they feel like this thing has somehow resurged and is taking all the people but as far as they know this is only happening on mid -pass. they don't think it's affecting you know the, the mainland and so Tristan you know gets you know, paired up with a band of, of warriors and some very cute characters too, and um, along with Gum Baby. <laughs> and so he kind of figures out pretty early on that he might be at fault for a lot of the things that are happening, but even he doesn't realize that it's, it goes beyond him. And everyone is out to get his book. And so at one point, we, we, we have an encounter with Br'er Fox, and he's trying to like save them, everybody, and he kind of ends up like sacrificing himself, and it's a really like sad moment. And, um, but he's trying to, you know, save the book and he can't save it. And then Tristan can't save it either. So Tristan is feeling, he, he, oh, he, he started the book not in a good place. And so far he's just getting like further and further down. I mean, he was grieving. He was sent away. He was, you know, dealing with the loss of his first match. And then someone tried to steal his book. He ends up in this new world where again, people keep trying to take the book and finally succeed in doing it. All while someone, he watches someone sacrifice themselves for him just like he watched his friend die so Tristan is having a really tough time but it doesn't matter how tough of a time he's having everyone else is just like you need to fix this and it's a lot for a kid to have to it's a lot for a grown-up to have to but we have to remember that Tristan is just a kid in this story but even though everybody's like telling him that he needs to fix it I do think it's nice that the John Henry character is the one that seems to be the most understanding about who he is and where he's coming from and they have a moment where they connect over his interest I guess you can call it like that in boxing and and this is where we kind of get a little bit of a history lesson you know about the history of what boxing meant to black people and what it meant to slaves um, it's just so many so many things that are embedded in this story it really makes you rethink some things um, you know for a lot of people athletics in general or were for a long time the only real way for you know black people to find success you know things have changed I'm not saying that they haven't Obviously, people have more opportunities now than they, you know, they once did. But a lot of that stems back to our history. You know, um, boxers and you know MMA fighters and stuff like that. They came from a place where you didn't really have a choice. You fought because you had to. And I like the fact that this story kind of, you know, mentions that and, and, and explains that, but it still lets you know that there's honor to be had in building up that skill as a boxer and being a good fighter. So you know, you get both sides of it. You know, so um, moving on for that, the story. Um, Sorry, <laughs> the story gets to the point where you find out the reason that all of this is happening to Tristan is because he has a special ability that he didn't know he had. No one knew he had. The people who took his book just wanted the stories in the book without knowing that some of those stories were inside him. And he has now been called an anensum. So if that sounds familiar, it's because of the um, African god that people are now familiar with, Anansi, because of works like... Um, I think it's called American Gods. I think it was like a, I know it was a book, I read the book, <laughs> but I think it was like an HBO series or something like that. And for some reason, it's one of the um, African Gods that's been really like popular for a long time. But, you know, for me, I feel like a lot of times 
people get their token character and run with it. So I am not tired of Anansi in any way whatsoever. But I did like the fact that he didn't dominate this book. I'm just going to go ahead and let you know that right now. Yes, uh, he plays a role, but he doesn't dominate this book. And I really appreciated that because um, I, I like Anansi's story and I want to read more of his stories. But I feel like he's one of those characters that white people or, or even non-black people have just kind of latched onto. And they're like, oh, we have our one African god that we're going to read about. <laughs> So I'm not hating on Anansi in any way whatsoever, but I like the fact that he was included in the story, but he didn't dominate the story. But his ability um, to tell stories is, is somehow given to Tristan, and so he becomes this Anansom, and they realize we don't need the book, we can get stories from him. He can literally bring stories to life, and I love the descriptions of those moments when he tells a story and you see it come to life. I'm not going to tell you how it happens, but just know that that's something that happens in the story. All right, so let's move forward a little bit. Um, in the story, all of this stuff is happening on Midpass, and so he meets John Henry. He's already lost Br'er Fox, but he meets Br'er Rabbit, and that is a part of the story that I, w I knew there was something there. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I knew there was something about the Br'er Rabbit character, and I didn't know what it was. So when it happened at the end to reveal what was kind of special about that character, I thought it was pretty good. Kind of as, as closer and closer it got to it, I saw it coming, but I didn't see it coming like right at the beginning, which I thought was good. So, just letting you know something about that character. Plus some other characters that show up. There's one character that's so cool. I want to talk about him so much, but I'm really trying not to make this a super spoiler. Like, I really want people to have something to look forward to when they read. But just know there is another super cool character. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but I'll just say if you like blackbirds, like ravens or crows, specifically crows, and you're familiar with some folklore around that, you might know who I'm talking about. But if not, that's okay. Look it up or read the book. So... Basically, we find out that this issue that they think is mostly affecting Midpass isn't just affecting Midpass. It's affecting the mainland of Op as well. And so they end up having to travel to there. And of course, it's not an easy journey. There's, you know, these claw things, you know, are out there grabbing people and taking them away. There's also like these killer bees type things. Like, it's crazy, y'all. And so once, once they get to the mainland, they're actually in search of another, like, true African god. Like, Nancy's a true African god. This guy's a true African god. Some of the um, mid-past gods are the lesser gods. They are more fol folklore characters who have been um, made into gods um, in this world. And But it, regardless, they're all very powerful, honorable characters. But this other god, and again, I don't want to give too much of that away because I want you to have something to look forward to, has been captured by these things. But he's so powerful that even though they've captured him, they couldn't, like, take him away like they did everyone else. They could literally only contain him, and, and they haven't even fully contained him, but he's not able to defend his world until, you know, Tristan and his band of characters show up, and he figures out a way to use his storytelling ability to free this god. And you think that this god would be grateful, but of course not, because he, he knows, even though everybody else hasn't figured it out yet, that a lot of this is Tristan's fault, which, again... It is Tristan's fault, but a lot of it goes beyond him. And so he's like, uh, thank you, I guess, for you know freeing me, but I'm not happy with you people. I don't want to help you. But, you know, the story has to keep going. So he does end up giving them some information that they can use to continue their journey. And they do that. And they go up against some more, you know, more obstacles and challenges or whatever. And so it turns out that what they need, um, they kind of had all along, they had, but they have, they have to go back and um, face the, the god and... Tristan is able to use the abilities of one of the other gods to send out a message to basically create what is essentially a big showdown on the mainland. And so um, one thing that I didn't mention, and I've been saving it because we're getting close to the end of me just kind of barreling through this, is when Tristan fell through, before he landed in the bone ship, he encountered an entity. And I am going to tell you about this character. I'm going to try not to tell you too much, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um... The character um, is very dark and elusive. For the most of the story, Tristan can't see him, barely can hear him and understand him. All he knows is he has to call him Uncle C. And so he keeps this to himself for most of the story, and I think he reveals it when that um, god that I didn't want to tell you about says that he knew this was kind of his fault, and that was when he re kind of reveals that, yes, it's true, something else is going on here. And so it, basically we have kind of like, there's a bunch going on, but there's three basic things that are going to converge at this big showdown that he's helped orchestrate. So he sent out this message that's going to get all the mid-past people, any mainland people that are left, plus some mountain people that he's encountered, along with any of the, you know, the pure gods and any of the, you know, the demigods, the folk, you know, all of them are going to come to this one place. And it's going to bring these three major things together. The mysterious Uncle C character that you almost forget about, because he, 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 he appears here and there, but you really don't know his significance. So he's going to be there. This other creature, the one that I mentioned that no one wants to talk about, he's going to be there. 
And then most of all, Tristan is going to be there with all the support of the other people. These are people who have been divided for a long time. You got two different lands. And even within those two different lands, there's been division. They haven't been sharing their stories with one another. They definitely haven't been sharing resources and things like that. And so this showdown is what brings all these people together for the first time. And you begin to realize that even though he might have been the one who punched the hole in the sky, he wasn't the one who started their problems. Their problems started long before he got there. And this is the culmination at the end is where you begin to realize that. And it connects back to the world that Tristan comes from once he realizes that everything that's happening in this world affects the world that he comes from. I mean, he, he puts it together. He's been chased by, you know, slave shackles, this whole, you know, adventure. And then when he finally meets the creature that no one wants to talk about, and it's basically a slave ship. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, so that's that's the one thing that he has to kind of, you know, battle. And, and the way he resolves that, I think, is very clever. And then we meet Uncle C, and we figure out what he really is and about. And that's the part that blew my mind. And maybe, I don't know, I'm super sensitive right now, but he is the evil personification of cotton. Like, literal cotton. White puffs that grow on the ground that were picked by slaves. That's what Uncle C is. He is the evil, literal personification of cotton. And I could go in more into it, but I won't. I mean, I gotta give you something to read. I mean, but just having that revelation, but just having that revelation with this, you know, adventure story that's been happening. And, and again, I know some of what I'm sounding sound, may sound really serious and deep because in a way a lot of it is, but this is a, a very light story <laughs> despite all the serious and darkness. It's very humorous. I mean, it's a kid's adventure. This is a kid's book, people. It's a middle grade novel. And so, but for me, it just really hit home meeting Uncle C and seeing him, what he was, and is and what he represents and back to the history of black people in America so much of history that people want to ignore or pretend didn't happen or doesn't exist even to this day I mean let's even okay let's take the whole slave thing off the table cotton itself it's it's one of those resources that is so expensive so damaging in so many ways I mean don't get me wrong like everyone else I love a 100% cotton shirt but do you know what it takes to produce cotton and then throw slavery onto that. I mean, there's just, I'm going off. Anyway, so let me wrap this up. I really enjoyed Tristan Strong, Punch of the Hole in the Sky. I am very excited for the next book and I hope the author continues to, you know, write more stories along this line. I may look and see what else he's done. Maybe he's done like some adult fiction and stuff like that. I don't know. Um, I believe, oh, I should have looked this up. I'll post it on the screen, his name. I believe it's Kwame something. Um, I feel terrible. I should have been more prepared, but I was just so excited to talk about the book. So anyway, there it is, uh, a middle grade fantasy novel featuring American, African-American gods and African gods in a time when, you know, we're, we're lost, we've lost touch with the culture that was taken from us, but this is an opportunity to share it with everyone, not just black people in America, but all people in America should be exposed to the what this is American history you know these may be African American gods or African gods but they've all come to this country and I love the fact that that it's you know being presented in such a way that's entertaining but also helps you to connect to the past to learn from the past so that it doesn't get repeated so I'll end on one final note to say that um, the story is set in a modern setting, so it's not like it's a story that many people won't be able to relate to because you know it's historical or whatever like that no you know, and, and a lot of the things that I mentioned are all done in like metaphorical type ways in, in, with imagery and things like that. So there's nothing that's like in your face. I don't think at any point in the book, and I could be wrong, but I don't think at any point in the book he actually says the word slave. Like, you know, like you, you figure it out from reading that these are references to slaves. But um, it, it, anyway, I'm just letting you know that because I don't want you to get the feeling this is a really dark or hard book. It's not. It's, it's really funny. <laughs> Gum Baby is crazy. <laughs> so um, that was me rambling about Tristan Strong, Punches a Hole in the Sky. I would love for some of you to read this. If you have read it, let me know. And that's all I have for now. Bye-bye.